In the lecture today, we are going to look at Turing machines. Turing machines are a simple model of computation that is as strong as any computer. So they can do any computation that a computer can do. And surprisingly, they have been invented long before the first computers were built. Roughly speaking, you can think of a Turing machine like this. You have some machine that has attached to it a tape, and this machine can read and write the cells on this tape. So a Turing machine has some control unit, which is basically a finite automaton with some state. It has a read-write head that can read and write cells on the tape. In each step, the machine reads the symbol that is currently under the read-write head. It overwrites the symbol, it changes the state, and it moves one place to the left or one place to the right on the tape. The tape is assumed to be infinite in both directions. The idea is just that we want to have an unlimited memory. Anyway, with a finite computation, the machine can only visit finitely many cells on the tape, so effectively it will only use a finite amount of memory, but we don't want to limit the memory from the start, so whatever memory the Turing machine needs for computation, we make it available. For a Turing machine, the initial tape content looks like this. The input word is written on the tape, and left and right of the input word we have only blank symbols. The blank symbol is what we denote by this box. So a Turing machine does not only have an input alphabet sigma, a Turing machine also has a finite tape alphabet gamma. And this blank symbol, for instance, is part of the tape alphabet, but not part of the input alphabet. This tape alphabet allows the Turing machine to operate to compute with a larger alphabet than just the input alphabet. So we have the input word written on the tape, and the Turing machine is started with the read-write hat on the first symbol of the input word. The transition function of the Turing machine looks like this. It takes as input a state, the current state of the machine, a symbol from the tape alphabet, the symbol which is currently written on the tape under the read-write hat, and it tells what state to switch to, what symbol to write on the tape, and whether to move the read-write hat to the left or to the right. And this transition function delta is a partial function, so delta QA can be undefined, and if it is undefined, then it means that if the state is currently Q and the machine reads an A on the tape, then the machine stops. So an undefined value for the transition function means that the machine stops the computation at this point. If delta QA is Q prime BX, then this can be understood as follows. If the machine currently is in state Q, and it reads an A on the tape, then the A is overwritten by B. The read-write hat moves one position to the left if X is L, or one position to the right if X is R. And the machine switches the state to Q prime. A deterministic Turing machine, which we will abbreviate just by TM, is a seven tuple with the following ingredients. We have a finite set of states, just like for a finite automaton. We have a finite input alphabet, and this input alphabet is a subset of the tape alphabet, and it does not contain the blank symbol. We have a finite tape alphabet gamma. We have a transition function that we've just discussed already. We have a starting state. We have a distinguished blank symbol, which we will denote by such a box. And we have a set 
of final of accepting states. So the queue, the set of states, the input alphabet, the starting state and the final state are basically the same as for finite automata. The transition function is defined slightly differently and we have a blank symbol and the tape alphabet. Now we make one assumption for Turing machines, namely that whenever we reach a final state, then we stop the computation. So we say that delta QA should be undefined whenever Q is a final state and for whatever tape alphabet symbol A. In principle, this assumption is not needed, but the Turing machine anyway accepts all words where the computation reaches a final state at any point. So after reaching a final state, we can also stop. It makes no point to continue after having reached the final state. A configuration of a Turing machine is a pair that consists of a state and the tape content. So the state is just a member of Q and the tape content is a function from the integers to gamma. So for every integer, C tells us what symbol stands at the position given as an input to this function. So we can think of this like this. We have a machine that's currently in state Q. The head of this machine stands on the symbol indexed with zero. And the tape content right of the head, or below the head at C0, right of the head at C1, C2, and so on. And left of the head, the tape content is C of minus one, C of minus two, C of minus three, and so on. We moreover require that at each point, there's only finitely many positions on the tape where the symbol is non-blank. So on almost all positions on the tape, there's a blank symbol, only on finitely many, there's a non-blank symbol. And since there's only finitely many symbols non-blank, we can actually denote this infinite configuration by a finite word, and that's what we do here. So we always have natural numbers n and m, such that left of index minus n, all symbols are blank, and the right of index m, all symbols are blank. And then we can denote this configuration by a finite word, namely by the word c minus n, c minus n plus one, up to c minus one. Then we put q, the state that the machine is in, and we follow after q with c0, c1, c2, up to cm. So we write the Q as part of the word to denote the configuration and Q stands in front of the symbol that is currently read. So the symbol after the state Q is the symbol where the read write hat stands on. So since all other symbols on the tape are blank, this word is actually enough to fully determine the configuration of the Turing machine. We know what's the state and we know the tape content. Everything else is blank. So we will denote configurations of Turing machines by finite words of the form some word over the tape alphabet followed by a state followed by a word over the tape alphabet. So for instance, this configuration so we have a Turing machine in state Q. The read right head currently is reading the A. Left of the head we have the E and then only blank symbols. Right of the head we have BB and then only blank symbols. So we can denote this by this finite word. We are in state Q. Left of the head we have the E and then only blank symbols. And right of the head we have BB. And we are currently reading the symbol that stands right of the Q. So we are currently reading the A. So this finite word denotes this configuration. But equivalently, we could have denoted this configuration 
in different ways, we could also denote this configuration by this finite word. We have here an additional blank symbol at the right, but whether we write this blank symbol or not doesn't make a difference, because the understanding is anyway that everything right of the end of this finite word is blank. So this and this denotes the same configuration. Likewise, this denotes the same configuration, and we can also add blank symbols left and right, and it still denotes the same configuration. So, since all these denote the same configuration, we introduce a special symbol for this. We say that W is equal to V. So, the finite word W denotes the same configuration as V. And we express this with this wavy equality sign. So, all these express the same configuration. So, since they express the same configuration, we will not distinguish between them. So to some sense, we are only interested in the configuration that is denoted. We are not interested in how the configuration is denoted. So we will consider this configuration, or this word, we will consider the same as this word. The computation step relation for Turing machines is defined as a relation on configurations as follows. So we denote this computation step relation by this turn style symbol again. So this is a relation on configurations. We have a step from a configuration VQAW. So we are in state Q and we read the letter A. Then if the Transition function delta tells us that if we are in state Q and we read an A, then we switch to Q prime, we write the B, and we move to the right. So this happens exactly here in this step. The state Q is switched to Q prime, the A is overwritten by B, and we have moved one to the right. So how can we see this? First we were left of the A, and now we are right of the B. So we've moved one. To the right, we've jumped over this symbol. Now this defines what happens on configurations if we move to the left. So if we are in a configuration of the form VCQAW, so we are again in state Q, we read a letter A, then if our transition function tells that if you're in state Q and we read an A, we switch to Q prime, we overwrite A by B and we move left. So the Q is switched to Q prime, the A is overwritten by B, but now we have moved left. So what does this mean? We left was a C. So we, if we move left, then we now stand on the C. So in our notation of configurations, that means that Q prime stands left of the C. We again write this turn style symbol to the star for a computation of zero or more steps. So let's have a look at an example. Here we have a transition function of a Turing machine. And we assume that in all cases that are not defined, the transition function is undefined. We start our Turing machine in the starting state Q0 with the input word AA. So we have AA on the tape, everything else is blank, and our machine stands on the first A. Now what do we have? We are in state Q0, we read an A, we remain in state Q0, overwrite the A by an A, and we move to the right. The A remains an A, and we have moved one to the right. So now the head stands on the second A. We are still in state Q0, we read an A. So we stay in Q0, overwrite A by A and move to the right. So we get this configuration. Now we are still in state Q0, but what do we read? Remember that this is just a notation for a configuration. There is blank symbols everywhere, left and right. So we read a blank symbol. 
So this notation denotes the same configuration as this. So this is the same as saying that we are on configuration AAQ0 blank. So we are currently reading a blank symbol. If you are on Q0, we read a blank symbol. We switch to Q1, overwrite the blank symbol by C, and move to the left. So this blank symbol will become a C, the Q0 becomes Q1, and we have moved left. That means we jump over this A and we are now left of the A. We stand, the head stands on the A now. Now we are on Q1, we read an A. So we remain in Q1, overwrite A by B, and we move left. So this A will become a B, and we move one to the left. We are still in Q1, we still read an A. So we do the same thing again. The A is overwritten by B, we remain in Q1, and we move to the left. This A will become a B, and we move one to the left. Where do we move to? Again, we have blank symbols on the left and on the right. So this configuration that is denoted by this is the same as the configuration denoted by this word. So we can assume that we have a blank symbol to the left. So if we now move left, then we are now left of this blank symbol. So the A will be overwritten by B. We stay in Q1 and we move left. And now we are in state Q1. We read a blank symbol, and this is not defined. So by assumption, the transition function is undefined for this case. And every configuration where the transition function is undefined, so if you're on configuration of this form, VQAW, where delta QA is undefined, such a configuration is called a halting state. The Turing machine will stop the computation at this point. The next transition step is not defined. So this configuration that we've ended in is a halting state. Our computation stops at this point. Also for Turing machines, we would like to visualize them using these nice transition graphs. So for Turing machines, the idea is as follows. If we have that the transition function delta QA is equal to Q prime BX, then we write in the transition graph an arrow from Q to Q prime. That's the same as for finite automata, since we switch the state from Q to Q prime, from Q to Q prime. Now, the label along this arrow is different from finite automata. We now write A slash BX, this means that if we read an A, we overwrite it by B, and then we move in direction X. So the X is either L or R. So for instance, this Turing machine can be visualized by this transition graph. So what do we see in this graph? Just like for the transition graphs for finite automata, we see the nodes, which are the states of our Turing machine. So we have states Q0, Q1, Q2. We see what are the starting and final states. The starting state of our machine is indicated by an extra incoming arrow. The final states of our machine are indicated by a double circle around the state. So in this case, only Q2 is final. We can see from this visualization what is our tape alphabet namely all the letters that are used along the arrows. That's our tape alphabet, gamma. We can, from the visualization, not see what is the input alphabet. So the input alphabet should still be given separately. And we can see from this visualization the transition function. So let's have a look at some of the arrows. So for instance, we have from Q0 we have an arrow to Q1, and it says that if we read an A, we overwrite this A by a B, and we move to the right. And this is exactly what's told here. If we are on Q0, we read an A, then we switch to Q1, 
we overwrite a by b and we move to the right. Let's look at one more arrow, maybe at this loop. If we are in q1 and we read the b, we stay in q1, we overwrite the b by an a and we move to the right. So this is this is this clause of our transition function. If we are in q1 and we read the b, we stay in q1, we overwrite b by an a and we move to the right. The language accepted by a Turing machine M, denoted by L of M, consists of all the words W over the input alphabet sigma, such that if we start the machine in the configuration Q0W, then there is a sequence of computation steps that brings us to a final state. So this initial configuration here means that we have the input word W written on the tape, left and right only blank symbols, the state is Q0, so our initial state, and the read write hat stands on the first symbol of W. And then there is a sequence of computation steps, and since we are here using deterministic Turing machines, this is a unique sequence of steps that brings us to the final state. So if a word is not in this language, this can have two courses. The first course could be that we reach some halting state VQW, where the state that we are in is not a final state. So the Turing machine does some computation, and then at some point it reaches a state Q with input letter A, where delta QA is not defined. So the machine stops. And if this state that we are in is not a final state, then the word is not accepted. And the other reason can be that the machine never stops. So we start the machine with input word W, and the machine keeps computing infinitely. It never halts. If it never halts, then also the word is not in the language of the machine. So if we look at this Turing machine, and we assume here that the input alphabet is AB, what is the language accepted by this Turing machine? Now, if we look along the transitions, we see that whenever the machine reads a B, it overwrites it by A. Whenever it reads an A, it overwrites it by B. So it swaps A's and B's. But this is actually not important here because the machine always moves to the right. So the machine will actually never read what it has written. So the only important thing here is that whenever we read a B, we stay in the same state. So if you're on Q0 and we read the B, we stay in Q0. If you're on Q1, we read the B, we stay in Q1. But if we read an A, then we alternate between Q0 and Q1. So if you're on Q0, we read an A, we swap to Q1. If you're on Q1, we read an A, we switch to Q0. And we accept if you're on Q1 and we read a blank symbol. So when do we end up in Q1 reading a blank symbol? We end in Q1 reading a blank symbol if the input word that we were given contains an odd number of A's. So for instance, think about a word that just contains an A, then we read the A, we swap to Q1. Now we are at the end of the word, we read a blank symbol, and we switch to Q2 and accept. And since the B's don't really play a role, we just stay in the same state, it means that the language accepted by this Turing machine consists of all words over AB that have an odd number of A's. The class of languages that are accepted by Turing machines is called recursively enumerable. So a language is called recursively enumerable if it is accepted by some Turing machine. So let's construct a Turing machine that accepts the language a to the n, b to the n, c to the n for n is greater than equal 1. 
We have already shown that this language is not context free, so constructing a Turing machine for this language means that Turing machines can accept languages that are not context free. The idea of our construction is as follows. We walk over the input word, and in each time we walk over the input word, we replace 1a by 0, 1b by 1, and 1c by 2. We will use input alphabet ABC. We will use a larger tape alphabet. So next to ABC, we also need a 0, 1, 2, and we have the blank symbol. And we will use states with the following meaning. Namely, if we are in state Q0, then we expect to read an A. We replace this A by a 0. We move right and we switch to the next state Q1. Now Q1 has the task of finding the first B, so we keep moving right until we read a B. If we read a B, we replace it by 1. We move to the right and switch to Q2. Now Q2 searches the first C. We keep moving right until we read the C. Once we have found the C, we replace the C by 2, and we move left and switch to Q3. So Q3 now should bring us back to the next A to be replaced. So we keep moving left until we see a 0, that's one of the A's that has already been replaced, and then we move to the right and switch back to Q0. If there are more A's, then we now stand on the next A to be replaced, and Q0 will do the job by replacing A by 0, then searching the next B, and so on. Now, if we switch to Q0, and we see a 1 in state Q0, then it means that we have removed all the A's. All the A's have been replaced by zeros, and now we see a 1, that's one of the B's that has been replaced by 1. That means all the A's have been removed, so we should in principle be finished. So we switch to Q4, and now the task of Q4 is to move once all over the word, and to check whether there are still B's or C's left. And if no B's or C's are left, then it means that we have correctly, simultaneously replaced A's, B's and C's always by zeros, ones and twos. And since we've always replaced 1A, 1B and 1C each time, it means that there were the same number of A's, B's and C's. So if we can move over the entire word, not finding any more B's or C's, then we accept and switch to our final state, Q5. So this is the states of our automaton, and our starting state is Q0. Now, in Q0, if we read an A, we want to replace it by 0, and move to the right, and switch to Q1. So this, this transition, if you read an A, we overwrite it by 0, move to the right, and switch to Q1. Now the task of Q1 was to find the next B. So Q1 needs to be able to skip A's, as well as B's that have already been replaced. So we have to be able to skip A's, just walk over them to the right, and we also walk over ones, that's B's that have been replaced already. Now as soon as we find the next B, we replace the B by 1, and we move to the right and switch to Q2. Now Q2 has the task to find the next C, so it needs to be able to skip over B's, and to skip over C's that have already been replaced. So if we see a B, we just leave it, and we walk to the right. If we see a 2, that's a replaced C, we just skip it and move to the right. If we find a C, then we replace it by 2, we move to the left and switch to Q3. Now the task of Q3 is to walk all the way back to the beginning of the word, not completely the beginning, but to the zero, so to the last A that has been replaced, and then switch to Q0 and try to continue the replacement. So first of all, we need to move all the way back. So that's this loops. We have to walk back to the left over C's that have been replaced, so over 2's. 
we have to move back over bees that are possibly st still there, over bees that already have been replaced, and over A's that are possibly still there. Now, once we've done this, at some point we will find the zero, so a replaced A, and if we see the zero, then we switch to Q0 and we move to the right. So if we see a zero, we leave it a zero, we move to the right. Now the Q0 stands either on the next A to be replaced and the whole process starts over, or the Q0 stands now on a one, meaning that we have already replaced all the A's and we should continue with checking whether everything has been replaced. So if we are reading in Q0 a one, then we switch to Q4. And now the task of Q4 is to walk over the word and to check that all letters have been replaced so that there's no A's, no B's and no C's left. So Q4 can walk to the right and it can skip over replaced letters. So it can skip over twos and ones. It doesn't need to skip over zeros because we already have skipped all the zeros when we switch to Q4. So now if Q4 skipping over replaced Bs and replaced Cs, if we reach the blank symbol, then we know everything has been replaced and we accept. If in Q4 at some point we read any letter A, B or C, then there is no transition defined. So we stop and we do not accept. So then we have a non-accepting halting state. Now let's have a look at an example computation. We start our Turing machine in the initial state Q0 with the input word AABBCC. So we are in Q0 and we read an A. In Q0, if you read an A, we replace the A by zero, we move to the right and switch to Q1. So now the A is zero, we have switched to Q1 and we've moved one to the right. Now we are in Q1, we read an A, we leave the A, we move to the right, stay in Q1. Now we are in Q1, we read a B, that means we overwrite the B by a one, move to the right and switch to Q2. Now we are in Q2, we read the B, we leave the B, move to the right and stay in Q2. In Q2, we now read a C, we overwrite the C by a 2 and we move to the left. So now this C becomes a 2 and we will move 1 to the left again. Now we are in Q3 and we read a B, so we leave the B, move to the left. Now we are in Q3, we read a 1, we leave the 1, move to the left. Now we read an A, we leave the A, move to the left. Now we're in Q3 reading a zero, we leave the zero, move to the right, switch to Q0. So now basically the same thing that we've done repeats. So the Q0 will replace the A by a zero, then we switch to Q1, Q1 searches the B, replace it by by a one, then we switch to Q2, this finds the C, replaces it by two, and we walk back again. So to abbreviate things, we have a number of computation steps that brings us to this configuration. We have now replaced this A by zero, this B by one, this C by two. We have moved back to the zero, moved to the right, and we are in Q0 again. Now we are in Q0 and this time we read a 1. We have replaced all of the A's and we read a 1 which is a replacement of B. We leave the 1, we move to the right, switch to Q4. Now Q4 leaves 1's and 2's intact. We stay in Q4, we move to the right. So Q4 will move to the, leave this one, move to the right, leave this two, move to the right, leave this two, 
move to the right. It walks over these symbols to the right. So after a number of steps, more particular in three steps, we reach this configuration. Now we are in Q4 and we read a blank symbol. If you're in Q4 reading a blank symbol, we leave the blank symbol, move to the left and switch to state Q5. So we get this configuration. This is an accepting state Q5. So our input word AABBCC is accepted by this Turing machine. Now let's have a look what happens if we read a word that should not be in the language. So we are now reading the input word AABBBCC. Now, in first place, the same will happen as here. The machine will walk over the word, replace one A by zero, one B by one, one C by two. So after a number of steps, we get to this configuration. Now it will do the same again, replace this A by zero, this B by one, this C by two, and we will reach this configuration. Now, this is similar to the configuration that we've reached here, but now there's one B left. So let's see what happens. So we have Q0 and we read a one. So we take this transition from Q0 to Q4, we move to the right. Now we are in Q4, we read a one. So we leave the one and move to the right, stay in Q4. Now we are in Q4, we read a B. And there's no transition defined for B in Q4. So this is a halting state. Q4 is not accepting. So we have reached a non-accepting halting state. This word is not accepted by our Turing machine. Let's construct a Turing machine that accepts all words of odd lengths of the alphabet AB. Now, we don't really need to compute with the word, we just need to walk over the word and we need to remember whether we have read an even or an odd number of letters. So we just need two states Q0 and Q1 to remember whether we have read an odd number of letters or an even number of letters. So we don't change the letters. If you read an A, we leave an A. If you read a B, we leave a B. And the same on these transitions. Now. From Q0, if we read a letter, we move to the right and we switch to Q1. From Q1, if we read another letter, we switch back to Q0. So we started in Q0 on the first letter of the word. So up to now we have read no letters, zero, an even number. If we read a letter, then we switch to Q1. So we've read an odd number of letters. If we read another letter, we again have an even number, we switch back to Q0. If we read one more letter, we again have an odd number, we switch to Q1, and so on. So always after having read an odd number of A's and B's, we are in Q1. If we have read an even number of letters, we are in Q0. Now we want to accept only if we have read an odd number of letters. Therefore, we only define a transition that allows to read the blank symbol for Q1. So we say that if you're on Q1, if you read the blank symbol, so if you have reached the end of the word, we leave the blank symbol, we move to the right, and we switch to an accepting state. We could also move to the left, or we could replace the blank symbol, it doesn't matter. As soon as we've reached an accepting state, we stop and we have accepted the input words. So we write multiple labels along an arrow as a shorthand for multiple transitions. So these two is actually shorthand for two transitions from Q0 to Q1. Likewise, these two labels are shorthand for two transitions from Q1 to Q0. There's various possible extensions of Turing machines that one could think about. For instance, you might want to introduce non-domestic Turing machines, or you might want to introduce Turing machines with multiple tapes. Extensions of deterministic Turing machines, such as multiple tapes or non-determinism, do not give extra expressive power. If you think of a Turing machine with multiple tapes, then this can be simulated by a Turing machine with a single tape. 
You can simulate multiple tapes by a single tape by either using a larger alphabet, larger tape alphabet, or you can write the multiple tapes on a single tape by interleaving the tapes. In each case, this can be simulated by a Turing machine with a single tape. The overhead comes from the fact that for a Turing machine with multiple tapes, you also have multiple read-write heads, so they have different positions on the tapes. And then if you simulate this on a single tape, then you have to mark the positions of these multiple read-write heads. And since we only have a single read-write head on a single tape, this head has to run forth and back in order to find the positions of the read-write heads on the simulated multiple tapes. So it invokes a polynom polynomial overhead, but except for this polynomial overhead, the expressive power is the same. The computation might take a little bit longer, but we can do the same computations. Also for non-domestic Turing machines, also they do not give extra expressive power. So first, what is a non-domestic Turing machine? For a deterministic Turing machine, the transition function takes a state and a letter from the tape alphabet, and it gives us a triple consisting of a state, a letter from the tape alphabet, and L or R, whether to move left or right. And now the non-domestic Turing machine gives us a set of such triples, and we can choose from the set. So possibly, in some steps, we have a choice between different actions to take. But in each case, this set will always be finite because we only have a finite number of states, a finite number of tape letters, and LR also is just a finite choice. Also, non-domestic machines do not increase the expressive power of Turing machines. And the idea is as follows. We can simulate a non-domestic Turing machine by a deterministic Turing machine using some kind of breadth-first search. We basically simulate all the computations of the non-domestic machine in parallel. We write all the possible configurations that the non-domestic machine can be in as a queue on our tape, and we each time simulate one more step of the non-domestic machine. So we take the next configuration, we simulate one step. This may give us possibly multiple configurations and we put them in our queue again. So we simulate all the possible computations in parallel. And if one of these computations leads to an accepting state, then we accept. Of course, simulating all these computations in parallel invokes a high computational overhead. And as far as is known, this overhead is an exponential factor. I say as far as is known because this actually is related to the famous open problem in theoretical computer science, namely whether p is equal to np. It is not yet proven that a non-domestic machine that runs in polynomial time cannot be simulated by a deterministic machine in polynomial time. Most researchers in theoretical computer science believe that this is not possible, so that we indeed need an exponential overhead to simulate a non-domestic machine. But this is still not proven. It's an open problem and maybe the most famous open problem in computer science at the current time. So why are we studying Turing machines? How is this relevant for modern computers? The Church Turing thesis states that every computation of a computer can be simulated by a deterministic Turing machine. So every computation of a modern computer, no matter how fast the hardware, no matter what hardware you have, it can always be simulated by a deterministic Turing machine. Of course, we are not speaking about time here. There is no concept of time for Turing machines, but everything that the computer can compute 
This can also be computed by a Turing machine. And the thesis, it's not a theorem, you cannot prove it, but the thesis has stood the test of time. So all notions of computers that have been invented, everything that is realizable in practice, is not going beyond what Turing machines can do. And this also holds for quantum computers. Also computations of quantum computers can be simulated by Turing machines. So also what quantum computers can do does not extend what Turing machines can do. They are equally expressive as Turing machines. So this means, and Turing has recognized this already almost a hundred years ago, this means that we can study the limits of what is computable by studying Turing machines. By studying this very simple model of automata, we can study the limits of computation in general. These are Alonzo Church and Alan Turing. They are both super famous and they stand at the cradle of the theory of computation. Alonzo Church is the inventor of the famous lambda calculus. The lambda calculus is also a Turing complete computational model. But the computation in the lambda calculus works in a completely different way. Alan Turing is not only known for the Turing machines that we have discussed, he is also known for suggesting the Turing test, that's a test to determine whether a machine or a computer is intelligent. And he played a key role in ending the Second World War, in cracking the German Enigma machine that was used for encryption in the war by the Germans. And both Alan Turing and Alonzo Church have independently proven that validity in predicate logic is undecidable. So Turing machines are as powerful as it gets. So it's natural to ask whether every language can be computed by a Turing machine. And the answer is no. There are languages that are not recursively enumerable. So these languages cannot be computed by any Turing machine. We will prove this fact. The main idea of the proof is that we have only countably many Turing machines over some alphabet, but we have an uncountable set of languages. So we cannot have a Turing machine for every language. What does it mean that a set is countable. A set A is said to be countable if the set contains at most as many elements as there are natural numbers. Formally this means that there is some subjective function from the natural numbers to the set A. Subjective means that every element of the set A appears in the range of this function. In other words, we can denote the set A as the set of elements f0, f1, f2, f3, f4, and so on. So the function f gives us an enumeration of the elements in the set A. Clearly, we only have a countable set of Turing machines over some finite alphabet sigma. The reason is that we can denote Turing machines as words, think of writing them just in ASCII text. And such a word is just a sequence of bits, and the sequence of bits is nothing else than a natural number. So every Turing machine can be denoted by a natural number, and that means we have such an enumeration of all Turing machines. So we have only countably many Turing machines over some alphabet sigma, but we have uncountably many languages over an alphabet sigma. Even if the alphabet sigma contains just a single letter A, we have an uncountable set of languages over 
a single letter alphabet A. For a contradiction, let's assume that we would have a countable set of languages. So there is an enumeration, L0, L1, L2, L3, of all the languages over the alphabet that just contains the letter A. Now we are going to define a new language, a language L, and we define L as follows. We say that for every natural number i, the word a to the power i is in the language L, if and only if a to the power i is not in Li. So by defining L in this way, we make sure that L is different from every language Li. So L is different from every language L0, L1, L2, and so on. So L does not appear in our enumeration, but L is a language over the alphabet A. So this is contradiction because we have constructed a language over the single letter alphabet A. This language is not among our enumeration, but we had assumed that we can enumerate all the languages over the single letter alphabet. So our assumption was wrong. The set of languages over this alphabet cannot be enumerated. It is not countable. So as a conclusion, there exist languages that are not recursively enumerable because we have much more languages than we have Turing machines. And finally, in this lecture, we are going to look at the concept of a universal Turing machine. A computer can execute any program that you like. So you're not going to buy a new computer for every program that you want to run. And similarly, for Turing machines, there exist Turing machines that are universal. And these Turing machines can run any program. They can simulate every other Turing machine. So how does this work? Similar like in a computer, a computer gets a program. You can think of a program just as a word and the computer executes this program, this word. A universal Turing machine takes as input also a Turing machine, which is described as a word. And it takes as input an input word u, and then it runs the Turing machine on this input word. So it simulates the Turing machine m on the input word u. So how should you imagine this? How are these Turing machine and the input word passed to our universal machine? You can think of this in different ways. One way is that we first write the word that describes the Turing machine to be simulated, then some special symbol, and then the word that is the input word for the Turing machine to be simulated. So this is given as input to our universal machine, and then our universal machine runs the Turing machine described by W on the input word U. And it's actually not so difficult to construct universal Turing machines. So we have the following theorem. There exists a universal Turing machine. So we can assume that we have a Turing machine that can simulate any other Turing machine over some given alphabet. 